Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. Episode 2497 of The Tom Woods Show. And I'm joined by two great folks, repeat guests of The Tom Woods Show. Dan McCarthy, syndicated columnist and also editor of Modern Age, which you can check out at modernagejournal.com. And our friend Jeff Deist, formerly of the Mises Institute, now with Monetary Metals, which, you you know, from time to time you hear me talk about. And I wanted to talk to, the, initially I want to talk to these two gentlemen about the, the, the extraordinary and perhaps surreal phenomenon of, of Donald Trump addressing the Libertarian National Convention. Of course, I still want to do that, but there, there's, been, there's been other developments from the Libertarians since I came up with the idea for this episode that we might also talk about. But in any case, gentlemen, I'm really glad to be talking to you, and thanks for doing this. You bet. Thanks, Tom. All right. So let's let's start off with um, with Trump coming out there and speaking. <laughs> so um, the thing is, I read because I wasn't there. I was in Iceland. I I read a transcript of it. I've seen the excerpt, but then I actually read a transcript. Uh, that was generated, you know, by whatever platform I was using. And I have to say, the speech on paper is a good speech. I think it's a good speech to to give to the LP. It it is basically the speech I would have written for him. If if, if I had been hired, you know, put the best spin on who I am for a libertarian audience, that's what I would have said. So, So that's one thing. The other thing, and I'd like to get your thoughts on on that, whether you agree with me. The other thing has to do with whether you, w- with the booing question. But let's that's that's uh, not quite as as substantive a, a matter, although it, it is important to me. But Dan, for example, um, let's start with you. Do, do do you think so? I thought he hit, even though they were booing him and maybe weren't listening, whatever. Um, I thought he basically hit the right points, even if I could maybe dispute with him that well, maybe you're glossing over some things in your record or this or that. But in terms of speaking to a libertarian audience, I think he did as well as we could expect him to. Oh, I totally agree. So, I mean, the whole point of the talk was to show libertarians who might be on the fence that there actually is a big difference between himself and Joe Biden. And that's not only based on the things that he's claiming that he's going to do or that he has done in the past. It's also based on the fact that he knows which issues to talk about. And it's based on the fact that Donald Trump is actually showing up before a libertarian audience and giving these remarks, I thought it was very interesting that at the very beginning, uh, Donald Trump says, why isn't Joe Biden here? And he cracks a joke, well, of course, Biden isn't uh, you know, coherent enough that he could do this. But the, the more important point is that Joe Biden is not asking for the votes of libertarians. He doesn't care, he's written them off. Donald Trump has not written them off. And even though Libertarian Inc. says that Donald Trump is basically a socialist, and even though a lot of Donald Trump's fans claim that Donald Trump is you know, an anti-libertarian nationalist or something, Donald Trump actually cares enough about libertarians that he will go to a high-profile libertarian event. He will make a very good speech that is pitched to them that talks about issues that they care about and that substantially does connect Donald Trump's own record with the things libertarians uh, prioritize, especially in foreign policy. And all of this shows that he actually you know, believes that libertarians are a neglected constituency. He wants their vote. He's offering them something in return. I thought it was a home run. And, and incidentally, before we go to Jeff, the speech was clearly written by somebody. This is not, this is not Trump riffing off the top of his head. Somebody put some time into this. I think that's right. But I mean, you know, a large part of the speech was actually, he was reading a column that D. Roy Murdoch had written. Yes, had written praising him. Yes. Uh, That said, however, the, you know, Trump material both before and after he started reading from this column was excellent. And you know, what it tells me too, is that, you know, one of the things, one of Donald Trump's messages to libertarians here was that I see you, I value you. I want you to be part of my coalition. He said that if they gave him the uh, libertarian nomination, he would appoint a libertarian to his cabinet. Uh, Whether or not that's going to happen, the very fact that someone advised Donald Trump to give this talk to the LP and the fact that someone helped him put together these remarks were very well attuned to a libertarian sensibility. That indicates that Trump already has people who are libertarian aware within his uh, circle. I think that's an excellent commendation. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, it's funny. He brought up Deroy Murdoch maybe three times. And I thought to myself, nobody under 40, no offense to Deroy Murdoch, but nobody under 40 knows who he is. I, th- I guess he's an American spectator these days, or still. 
but uh, I don't think of him as a great libertarian. He, he's kind of in that camp of um, American conservative slash, uh, you know, Bob Tyrrell, that those kind of circles. So I guess he could he could maybe get Trump's ear. But I thought this was a glimpse of the old Trump. You know, it, it's been almost eight years. We forget when Trump first came out, he was saying these things that just amazed us. And he, he made us laugh. And we, he's just said the kind of things that no one else would say. And so here, you know, he seemed a bit tired uh, in recent months with the criminal proceedings he has going on. He seemed, I mean, let's face it, he's older. He's a little fatter. Uh, his energy is not quite there. And he has the great fortune of running against Joe Biden, uh, which, you know, is a relative comparative type uh, endeavor. But I thought this, I thought he had some nice glimpses here. He sounded like the old Trump, as I mentioned. This is not a guy who's afraid of making it yet. He still has that quality, that sort of devil may care attitude. He's also a guy who, if you use politics as, you know, per se transactional, he comes out there and says what he'll do for you if maybe you do something for him, and then he calls people losers, or maybe you, maybe you just want to be three percent losers. I mean, that was very Trumpian, and so overall, I think it was it was a good move on his part. So the idea here was that the party had invited RFK Jr., Trump, and Biden to come speak. It wasn't that they wrote Trump a letter and said, we'd like you to come speak. They invited all three. And RFK Jr. and Trump accepted. And they, and they showed up. So just to contextualize this. Now, I know this is not the central point of the thing, but uh, a lot of people took issue with the fact that there was a lot of booing. And... I, 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 you know, I somehow got, I don't know why, I should have just been enjoying myself in Iceland. You know, I don't know how I got drawn into a discussion of this on Twitter. But my feeling is when somebody comes to speak to me, I sit and listen. And then this was blown up as, oh, well, if it had been any president other than Trump, I'm sure Woods would support booing him. But you know what? I wouldn't. I mean, can, can anybody listening to this actually imagine me booing somebody? Is that what you think that's compatible with? My personality, I sit and listen. For one thing, I feel like when somebody's being booed, the person becomes more sympathetic. I sympathize with somebody being booed. I don't want to make a guy I dislike seem sympathetic. It's dumb. But secondly, I don't know, it's buffoonish. It's, uh, and, and you may say, oh, but if it's a U.S. president, well, that person has done a lot of rotten things. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, that's true. I, but if I went to see uh, a, a U.S. Secretary of State give a lecture, that person is also responsible for a lot of terrible things. If you want to indicate how you feel, I, I feel like that is just a low-class, dumb, dumb guy way of going about it. Now, my wife and I disagree on this. She thinks that the booing could have been slightly educational for Trump, who is not used to crowds that hostile, particularly when on paper, he really thinks he's got some compatibility there. And maybe he needs to have you know some understanding that, he, that he's very much disappointed such people. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, do you guys give as much thought to this booing question as I obviously have? Dave Smith, a little bit before Donald Trump spoke, uh, gave some remarks that I thought set things up very well. And Dave Smith said, you know, libertarians are supposed to care about ideas. They're supposed to care about free speech. And, you know, they are not meant to be these kind of emotional, uh, you know, uh, very childish, puerile types that you see on our college campuses now who cannot stand to hear from someone they disagree with, who want to cancel everyone, who want to shout down a speaker, and they don't want to hear ideas. They don't want to have you know, any kind of alternative ideas presented to them. Dave Smith did a very good job of setting up the difference between an intelligent libertarian and a bratty, you know, sort of left-wing uh, cancel culture college student. And he told the audience, told the libertarian delegates, hey, if you just shout and jeer and boo Donald Trump, you're basically on the level of all of these, uh, you know, uh, kitty vandals on the college campuses. And he was right about that. I mean, that's what you expect. I do think that uh, Donald Trump was probably not expecting to get a very warm welcome here. And I think that uh, the point your wife makes is one that would be correct with any other politician. Any other politician only goes to audiences that he expects to be friendly. And if they turn out to be hostile, that would be an educational experience for that person. But with Donald Trump, I think it's different because Donald Trump is used to speaking to, especially early on in 2016, He's used to speaking to a lot of Republican audiences, including Republican audiences that were basically selected by the donor class and by insiders at the Republican debates in 2016. And mm -hmm. he knew that a lot of those people were going to hate him. They mm -hmm. were going to hate a lot of the things he said because he was going in 2016 talking about what a disaster George W. Bush was. 
what a disaster the Iraq war was. There were audiences that were booing him at Republican events as well. And uh, Donald Trump was perfectly happy to do that. Um, Donald Trump thrives on that kind of energy. He likes the almost professional wrestling quality of it. You can either love Donald Trump or you can hate him, but he, he wants to make sure that he gets an emotional response either way. He doesn't want to have people bored. That's the key thing. Um, so I think Donald Trump was expecting, uh, you know, this kind of hostile reaction. And I also think that he was not really worried about whether the audience in the room was with him. I think he was playing for a more normal kind of person who is philosophically libertarian, not a libertarian party activist, but who basically has been told, as I mentioned, both by Libertarian Inc. and also by a lot of Trump supporters that, hey, you may feel okay about Donald Trump, but he's really not the candidate for you because Trump's a socialist or Trump, you know, has a anti-libertarian nationalist agenda. This was a chance for Trump to say to relatively normal libertarians about whom, you know, that we know that they're out there because they listen to the Tom Woods show. This was a chance for Trump to say to them, hey, I want you in my coalition. Come on board, vote for me. Jeff, well, we, for, we, we forget, though, uh, it, what libertarian activists are really like. They're not like the Tom Woods show audience. The people who show up at these conventions are, are just a different breed and a far worse breed, let's be honest. Uh, and they played into the left-wing media's hands with booing. Of course, The Guardian and a lot of other outlets, CNN, picked up on that and ran with it. We're quite overjoyed. So, so I get that. But Trump loves this stuff. I mean, there's a huge advantage in not being an introspective person, not being particularly self-aware, just being happy with be, the, you know, the bull in the china shop. And he's always been that way. I mean, Daniel brings up those 2016 primaries. We forget. It, Donald Trump pulled off one of the greatest political upsets in modern history. If he were any other candidate, political science departments, whole teams of people would be writing books on how he did it. And I don't just mean defeating Hillary Clinton, which was an enormous, enormous upset, but also beating a very strong slate, a host of Republican governors. Remember Jeb Bush and Kasich and Rick Perry, uh, Ted Cruz, Scott Walker, the co-candidate. I mean, both of those without any ground game, without any support from the party, precinct by precinct. How did Donald Trump do that? Well, the, the journalists and PhD types are totally uninterested because they just consider this some sort of embarrassing incident in, in American history that was just sort of sweep under the rug as some retrograde uh, red state reactionary uh, movement, you know, people who were you know, scared of losing their country or something. It, you know, the whole Trump phenomenon is never truly examined from a sociological or political science perspective. It's just written off. And so I think that that extends to him. Now, I don't like him as much this time around. I, I really don't. I mean, when you say you boo him because you hate him, I, I don't hate him. I mean, I, yeah, I don't think he hates me. I look at Hillary Clinton and I, I viscerally dislike her. I look at Joe Biden, I see a, a, a real Lola who spent a career in politics as a grifting, you know, dumb, uncurious guy, whereas Trump is, is a showman. So, so I don't hate him. And, and we also forget this country owes him for kneecapping the Bush and Clinton families. That was a, a huge, he should be on Mount Rushmore for that. Now, his presidency was, was a disaster, of course. If you read Bob Woodward's book, Fear, it has some really good insider information. Of course, Woodward's no fan of Trump, but he interviewed a lot of people on the down low. And he got some really good information about how Trump was treated very much like JFK, his own Pentagon, his own Joint Chiefs of Staff, his own CIA, uh, his own VP, actively working to undermine him, his own family members. Because of flattery, he had allowed close offices in the White House work actively undermining him. I mean, um, so I, you know, I don't consider his presidency a success. I don't want him back. I don't think it's funny this time around. And I don't think there's any real benefit this time around. I don't think he can undo the deep state or whatever it might be. But, but nonetheless, what, you know, I, I don't hate his guts. And I think that's the difference between, let's say, the way the three of us view the world and the way a, an LP activist views the world, that this is, that, you know, it is childish. I think Daniel's term is correct. Hey everybody, Father's Day is coming up and Old Woods here is gonna help you be the hero of the day. Because I'm telling you something, your dad doesn't want another pair of socks or another knickknack that's gonna clutter up the house. You wanna give him an experience he'll never forget. You give him Omaha Steaks. The Father's Day experts at Omaha Steaks have made it easy to put a smile on the big guy's face this summer with hand-selected gift packages starting at just 
$89. Just go to omahasteaks.com and use promo code WOODS at checkout for an additional discount when you shop gourmet gift packages for Father's Day. With Omaha Steaks, the possibilities are endless, endless flavor, endless variety, and endless value. Truly, they have perfected more than steak, and your dad is guaranteed to love every bite. Pick from premium proteins like the juicy pork chops, air-chilled chicken, and beefy burgers. Go to omahasteaks.com, use promo code WOODS to get an exclusive savings. Shop for unforgettable gifts that are guaranteed to make dad's day. Because if there's one thing Omaha Steaks knows, it's the dad's want steak. That's omahasteaks.com, promo code WOODS at checkout to save on exclusive packages starting at just $89. Uh, one more quick note about the speech per se, and then I want to get back more or less into these more general observations. Uh, like the, the fact that the speech said, you know, I will support self-custody for all Bitcoin holders and, and uh, this, the U.S. will be where, uh, where you know, the, like the center of, bit, of crypto and all that. And, and I'm against CBDCs. And I, I thought this definitely shows the speech was written. Because, I mean, this is, I'm not saying that nobody his age knows about Bitcoin, but I know he doesn't know that much about it. And I know he only found out about CBDCs because Vivek told him, you know, but, but they put that in there. You know, so again, that was a very deliberate choice uh, to, to do that. And, and that's a, you know, we, we know what politicians' pledges are worth, but, but you know, Biden wouldn't make the pledge in the first place is the, is the point that, that uh, I'm sure they're trying to get across. And also the very mention, the use of the word neocons in there saying, I cleared out the neocons. Well, not, not entirely, and I'm, I'm, um, and I'm concerned about the possibility of uh, the role that Lindsey Graham might play in a second Trump term. All the same, the neocons didn't really like to be singled out or called neocons or identified as an interest group um, within presidential administrations. They like to just, you know, kind of blend in and just try to be government officials. They don't like to be called neocons, especially now that neocon has become uh, such a derogatory term and, and more and more of the America first people are catching on uh, to what's going on there. So the fact that he used that term, again, I think was a, deliberate choice on the part of whoever more or less put these uh, remarks together. I think it shows that um, there has been a real shift uh, in terms of the foreign policy views of the average person on the right side of the aisle. I mean, if you want to talk about, let's say in 2020, getting out of Afghanistan, you got far more cheers for that at a Trump rally than you would have at a Biden rally. Uh, just like the Democrats have become the party of Silicon Valley, and the party of investment bankers, they're also part of the neoconservatives. Uh, any uh, isolationist or uh, non-interventionist energy now is entirely on the right. And I think that's a pretty important thing to note in American politics. I think Ron Paul had something to do with that. I think Pat Buchanan had something to do with that. And I think just a general fatigue in, in the American public, with these endless wars and this, this idea that the debt is really starting to bite us on the you-know-what, and that inflation is, is really a serious problem for average people. And Biden is completely clueless, and his uh, supporters are completely clueless when they dismiss that. I think that all adds up to a lot of war fatigue. And, uh, you know, call it America first, call it isolationist, call it whatever you want. But it, it, it's a real phenomenon, and it's growing. And, you know, I always thought, as a Rothbardian libertarian in my younger days, that we could make a lot of headway on economics. We could explain to people, oh, you know, here's how taxes are inefficient. And, and here's how we need less government, but that foreign policy was just kind of a non-starter. And now it seems like we're making more headway on the foreign policy front than the economic front. Well, indeed, and, and the very fact that he mentioned in there, I think he said something like, did he, did he say something like, I'm the first president in 70 years who hasn't started a war? Which is an interesting, I mean, I, although it does make me wonder, did Jimmy Carter start any wars? I actually don't, no, no, I mean... I don't think so, but I mean, I still, I take his point. Yeah, Donald Trump emphasized uh, over and over again that uh, he wants to stay out of endless wars, that he didn't get us into any more of them. Um, and also he warned about World War III, which I think is very important as well. So uh, when we think about the stakes of this election, you know, every politician always says that the next election is the most important of our lifetimes. 
But the Biden administration really has been ratcheting up our degree of engagement with the Ukraine-Russia conflict. It started out with, you know, military aid and money, but now we're talking about sending advisors. We're talking about having NATO get indirectly involved by sending people. Uh, we're talking about attacks upon Russia itself with NATO weapons. All of this has a potential to escalate, um, you know, and, and Joe Biden, even if he were someone who wanted to keep us out of uh, a deepening conflict, he just isn't competent enough to, to prevent things from spiraling out of his control. So I think Donald Trump is very right to warn us about uh, the danger of, of World War III here. Also, you know, Tom, you had mentioned that politicians' promises always have to be uh, taken with uh, not just a grain of salt, but an entire salt mine. But um, when Donald Trump is using the right yardstick, however, when he talks about foreign policy, he's talking about keeping us out of the wars, which is very important. So in addition to the uh, question of whether or not a politician is going to live up to his word, if a politician at least reflects the idea that he knows what right and wrong actually are with respect to something like foreign policy and keeping us out of wars, that's a very good start. Uh, that's a good start in terms of what we might get from an administration, but it's even, even better in terms of the educational value of teaching the audience and teaching people who listen to Donald Trump that staying out of wars should actually be one of our prime priorities in foreign policy, our, foreign, our national interest and keeping out of conflicts that are unnecessary and that are endless. All right, so now we get to... I. I think we have more, a little bit more to say about this, but I feel like at this point we have to insert into the conversation something that happened after the Trump speech, namely the nomination process uh, for the Libertarian Party. So this was just a train wreck. I mean, it just can't be put any other way. Um, th there were just, well, you could go down the list of missteps and things that were done wrong and people who should have done this, but instead did that and you can do that all day long, and you'd probably be right. But the result of all that is that Chase Oliver is the nominee, and that just seemed impossible two years ago because uh, and people might not know who Chase Oliver is. We'll fill you in in a minute. But two years ago, the momentum was so far in one direction, and I think that was accompanied by an expectation that Dave Smith would be the nominee, and... um that would be the culmination of all the efforts that, that sure, had getting a clean slate into the, the Libertarian National Committee, an absolute sweep of all the bad people, which was everybody, uh, and, and the chair, just seemed like the sky was the limit. And, and the, the purpose of this, by the way, two years ago, was that the leadership of the LP during the COVID years had been as useless as the various lockdowns and mask mandates, they had done nothing to oppose. So they had to be cleared out. Doesn't matter what the future holds uh, after that. That just as a matter of justice, that had to happen. That they were absolutely useless. Plus, they went in for every left-wing fad, all the wokery, all the, it's, it was embarrassing, the desperate attempts to be respectable to the mainstream. Just awful. And they were driven out. So it seemed as if the other side, which is the crazy people who wouldn't know libertarianism if it hit them in the head, had been demoralized and that would be the end of it. But you got to hand it to him. You got to hand it to him. Chase Oliver stuck it out and he actually ended up winning. And he, I mean, you can, you can look him up. You should be on my mailing list. If you were on my mailing list, you would have gotten my email uh, that went through the problems with this guy. Uh, let it suffice to say, Chase Oliver is... A, the very people who booed Donald Trump just gave him the best present he could possibly have asked for. A candidate who will not peel away a single voter from voting for Trump. Uh, voters who were thinking, huh, you know, I just don't like Trump's abrasiveness or his this or that or whatever. They don't like something about him. But, you know, maybe if I just had one other out. Well, nope, you don't. <laughs> because over your dead body, would you ever vote for this guy? So, and, and there's nobody on the left who's co considering bolting to the LP of all places. So this is simply a gratuitous minus with no offsetting plus. So that's what has happened since. And so it's kind of like, yeah, Trump gets booed, but then I'm sure he's found out about Chase Oliver. He must be thinking, well, now that I've seen what you cheer, I guess I don't care so much about your boo. So wh what do you guys think? Well, Trump said, you know, if they didn't nominate him, they'd be consigned to getting another 3% as they have in the 3 past. 3% would be an I know, amazing that's, miracle. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. It's more like 0.3%, and even yeah. that might be 
on the yeah. uh, you know upper end of the estimate there. So uh, no, but this is as you say, this is actually great for Donald Trump. You've got a left libertarian basically as the nominee, someone who, in fact, I mean, among uh, Chase Oliver's many other uh, deficiencies, he was one of these mask mandate guys. He was going around even now. I mean, he's someone who seems like he's going to mask up at any minute. So, uh, you know, if you want that kind of libertarianism, you clearly aren't going to vote for Donald Trump. You never were. And your choice is probably between, you know, Chase Oliver or Joe Biden or, you know, who knows who else might be out there. Maybe RFK, God knows. But, um, you know, so I, I, uh, you know, since I have no investment in the Libertarian Party, I don't view this as a bad thing at all. I think this is, uh, this in fact is kind of true to form in a lot of ways. Uh, And it is sad that, you know, the Mises Caucus, which, you know, has people who do have more sensible views in, in many cases, that they got, uh, you know, they didn't get a presidential nominee, um, you know, that they would have liked. But on the other hand, I mean, it was a terrible field. And Michael Rechtenwald, who was supposed to be, I think, one of the more, you know, Mises-aligned people, he goes out there after taking marijuana <laughs> and is completely incoherent when he's making uh, public remarks. So that was, you know, that's a classic libertarian moment. That's the kind of people you're fielding. Of course, you're going to lose and lose badly, even to someone like Chase Oliver. Well, just so that I can, I want to always be a fair guy. So... It's one of these situations, Dan, where he doesn't favor a, quote, mandate, but he's just going to propagandize for masks using the LP platform, which is just not what you should do. I mean, we're, we have tweets from him, you know, going into well into 2021, and he's wearing one of these duck masks, you know, like, you know, the, the KN, whatever. it doesn't matter to me. I call it either a duck mask because you look like a duck or a suffocation mask because I, I have a friend who says, if you can wear one of those, for longer than 30 minutes, you're wearing it wrong, okay? And so he's got this whole thing, oh, this is great for when I, when when businesses mandate them or for when distancing isn't possible. He went in, he's using all the lingo. And so it's, it, it's and, 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 you know, and, and he's concerned that, quote, trans kids aren't getting the, the, the gender-affirming care they need. And it, it, is there an elite obsession he hasn't fallen for? You know, I mean, that, mm-hmm. that is like the old leadership of the party. What, y- yes, sir. What, it, it, the, the new thing is trans kids. Okay, I'll sign up. What's the next thing? Crazy masking that d- accomplishes absolutely nothing. I'm on board for that. Well, Tom, this has always been the left libertarian delusion. The idea that we share the same ends. We just advocate different means. And of course, I don't share the same ends with the left at all. Not even slightly. So what the world needs, what America needs in 2024 is an old right party. Uh, and Trump brings a slight element of that to the GOP. And I think at the grassroots level, there is, there is some of that. There is a pulse within the GOP of that. But the, the Libertarian Party had a chance to be that, at least this year. I mean, obviously, I don't, Trump doesn't, Trump the second time around is not as good, third time around to me, I guess. And of course, Biden is Biden and RFK really flamed out badly. He rolled over incredibly on Israel. And then he uh, chose this woman who became wealthy through divorcing one of the Google guys. Uh, I mean, gee whiz, she's talking about her immigrant grandparents. But how proud they must be of you. You know, you made it all on your own with billions of dollars from Sergey Brin in a divorce settlement. Um, millions, I want to say billions, whatever she got. So it really was a, a, a wonderful opportunity or the LP this year. And I don't follow the LP particularly. I'm not involved. I do know Michael Rechtenwald. He's a friend. He's a good guy. And he really was screwed over by NYU. Um, He's someone who really understands the left because of his former career as prof. Um, And and I think he's uh, reasonably well-read in the Rothbardian and Hoppian end of things. But so I don't exactly know what happened at the convention itself. But it is a shame because... Uh, if there was ever a time to bring back that uh, old right vibe, this is it. It's 2024. And I really fear that uh, Biden's going to win. Uh, now, I was wrong about Trump versus Hillary in 2016. So don't put any bets uh, based on my political recommendations. But I, I feel like uh, the, the polls are, are overestimating Trump's appeal this time around. And I think what Trump does is he really brings out uh, left-wing voters. I think he animates them uh, be, just because of their sheer distaste for the guy. And and of course, the other thing is that we can't trust our elections. We know that close elections in any of the swing states um, will will almost certainly be marked by some sort of fraud. I, I, I 
just don't believe these public officials when they tell us that Georgia and Arizona and, and some of these other states were clean elections. I just don't, I just don't think that's true. Hey, everybody, it's All Woods here with a mini, mini interview with our friend Jeff Deist, whose appearances on the Tom Woods show you all love so much. And we're talking about monetary metals, where he works now, and you've heard me talk about this nonstop. So now it's going to be Jeff's turn to talk about it. Jeff, tell me about monetary metals. What is the value here? Well, Tom, remember back in the day when Ron Paul used to ask Ben Bernanke, then chairman of the Federal Reserve, what's gold? What's the purpose of gold? Is it money? Why does the Fed hold it? And of course, he waffled and said it's a historical relic and it's just a precious metal, but it's not. I mean, for more than 5,000 years, gold's been money. There's $13 trillion worth of it out there just sitting around in bank vaults. Why don't we generate some interest from that? Why don't we put it to work as money, as a capital asset? That's the idea behind monetary metals. So what, what does a person have to do to be part? Do you have to come in there owning your own gold? Do they sell you the gold? How does it work? Absolutely not. Whether you've got physical metals that you want to ship to us safely or whether you want to simply send a bank wire or a check, we can convert your money into gold and get you started earning interest right away. All right, everybody, check it out monetary-metals.com slash woods. I have an account there. I know the people who work there. We all know Jeff Deist. So check it out for yourself, monetary-metals.com slash woods. Uh, let me uh, jump in just very quickly. And then Dan, if you want to, if, if perhaps you want to follow up on what Jeff said, you can do that in a second. Um, I don't know how many years I've known Michael Rechtenwald, but I don't know, it's got to be six or seven, I would say. And I also like him too. He teaches um, courses at libertyclassroom.com. He's very smart. Um, I was seeing people you know, on Twitter who don't know anything saying he's a failed professor. They wouldn't say that about like Jordan Peterson. You know, like they hounded that guy, right? This is do, like, do, do these people, these libertarians on Twitter not understand academia is not friendly to us. You know, hello, welcome to the world. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and, but, but uh, he ended up doing pretty well. They ended up paying him quite a bit when he, when he left. So actually he wound up, you know, I think he came out ahead in the situation, but he's a brilliant guy. There is no question about that. He's the author of numerous books. Um, and when he changed his ideology, which happens very, very infrequently toward the end of somebody's career, he just poured himself into reading our literature. And when you would ask him what he was reading, you know, typically in this situation, people say Hayek because they don't know what else to tell you. But when he said Mises, I thought, okay, now I know the guy's serious. He was really, really absorbing everything he can. Maybe being a political candidate isn't where his strength is, but he didn't deserve some of the abuse that he got um, for, you know, and yes, obviously, right, Dan, the thing you said, yeah, I, there's no, no defending that. But, but other than that, he, I mean, he really is honestly a good guy. And I, and I'm also a little surprised at how many libertarians are saying, I never heard of this guy. I feel like if you're a libertarian, you should know Michael Rechtenwald. I mean, how often do we get an academic who uh, most of the way through his career turns on a dime and becomes, uh, you know, a hundred percent supporter of everything we stand for and works and speaks and writes tirelessly about it. I mean, you should know who he is. I've hosted him many times on this yeah, show. But Tom, you know, what I would say is, and I don't know Rechtenwald, so I speak, you know, kind of uh, uh, with a distance here that otherwise might be missing. But if you're being praised by good people like Jeff Deist and by Tom Woods, you have a responsibility at that point to live up to their praise and to not go and embarrass yourself and embarrass them by doing what Rechtenwald did. So I view this as, you know, again, I don't know the guy. So I mean, my impression is based very much on this, you know, intoxicated performance that he gave at a time when he's trying to get a you know, nomination for president and to represent the party. Something about his character led him to make a very bad decision there. Now, you know, maybe he had some medical problem and he really needed medication. I don't know. But if that was the case, he probably shouldn't have been going out there and speaking to the public at all. But this, you have to have higher standards in this if you're going to be a representative of a philosophical movement. And that I think is, you know, there's no evading that one way or the other. You can be a nice guy, but if you just don't have the responsibility to do something more sensible than what he did, then you're going to go nowhere and you're actually going to damage your, your allies. So what, um, the thing is I have, I have dear friends who are in the LP, like in, in leadership roles, and I haven't spoken to them yet. Uh, maybe by the time this comes out, I will have spoken to them about what they're thinking right now. But so I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a weird position because I don't want to, 
I don't want to hurt them. I, I don't want to undermine them because they are trying to do good things. And I think they have done a lot of good things. But I think there is a, a, there's going to be a huge number of libertarians who, in con, you know, their consciences won't won't permit this. I mean, we're, we're talking about a candidate who, you know, who says Lou Rockwell is a bigot and a racist and stuff like that. Well, Lou Rockwell was Ron Paul's chief of staff. So that's one degree of separation. You know what I mean? So we're getting awfully close here to saying things we probably shouldn't be saying. And, and, and plus, there's nobody I respect who uses insults like that. I can't think of anybody I respect. Who, who talks like that or who fell for the COVID propaganda or any of the other stuff, drag queen story hour, the whole bit. Uh, there's just no way you can support. So I, this is the pro one of the problems of being in a political party is that you're expected that when you have the nominee, you got to endorse the nominee. You got to say, you know, we, we fought the best we could, but now this is the nominee we have. Um, I, I mean, and also, but let me say one other thing. Back in like 2012, we would be told um, you have to vote for Mitt Romney because otherwise you'll have Barack Obama. And, and, and that's the end of America. And, and yet Mitt Romney is such a terrible person that I would just say, I, that just doesn't seem like a compelling thing to ask of me. Whereas today, I feel like the country has gone down the wrong road so much and Biden is such a, a bad guy but is even worse than that, surrounded by really sinister people. If you made that appeal to me today and said, you have to do absolutely anything in terms of political support to get rid of this guy, I would, I would find it very hard to argue with you about that. Yeah, I guess I would reinforce something that Jeff said earlier. Libertarians have to choose whether they're on the right or on the left. And if they're not yeah. willing to make that choice and they try to bring together these totally incompatible left-wing and right-wing elements in a single party, you're going to be embarrassed time after time. You're going to have, you know, whoever may control the party, half or a third of the party is going to continue to be against them. You're going to have, you know, incidents uh, like we've had with this uh, convention where you wind up with the party still probably being somewhat slightly to the right, but nevertheless, it has a presidential nominee who's on the left. It's just pointless. I mean, why would you do that? The way to be effective as a third party is to make a clear choice as to whether you're on the left or the right, and then go after the people in one of the major parties who are insufficiently left-wing or insufficiently right-wing for the view that you want to uh, advance, and make sure to choose a narrow and you know, particular set of policies that you want to focus on. So like the UK Independence Party, for example, their whole thing was Brexit, the referendum, getting the UK out of the EU. They went after Tories who were squishy on those issues, they beat them, they embarrassed them. It wasn't about UKIP getting into you know, uh, public office all that much. It was rather about putting pressure on the entire political system, and they succeeded with that and got, the, got Britain out of the EU. Imagine if libertarians actually had a strategy like that instead of saying, hey, let's bring together you know, matter and antimatter. Let's bring together you know, sort of right-wing Rothbardian libertarians and left-wing you know, hate the Rothbardians. They, I mean, literally, they will demonize Rothbard. They, they loathe Rothbard as much as they loathe, loathe Rockwell. Let's put these two elements together and see what we get. Well, this is what you get. Well, let's not forget, UKIP actually disbanded after having achieved their goal of Brexit. I mean, that's a beautiful thing in and of itself, a political party with a goal. And let's not forget, though, know, one thing that we have, haven't mentioned is, except in passing, is Dave Smith. I mean, Dave is an absolute star. It, the, whatever it is, X factor, charisma, likability, however you want to term it. It's not something that can be taught necessarily. It's not even something that can be coached or developed. I'm at least I'm not sure about that, but Dave has it. And Dave also has the ability to attract a younger audience. His audience is totally outside the LP's orbit. You know, he just he has a cult a cross cultural effect by appearing on Rogan or through his own comedy shows or whatever it is. And he's very well read. He's really good on his feet. He's really good at a debate. He's not afraid to go up against people who are maybe academics or whatever it might be uh, to argue against them. He argued famously against Dennis Prager. He's about to go up against Chris Cuomo, I think, in a few days. Uh, you know, so Dave's a real star in the making. And the idea 20 years ago, oh, he's a comedian. You know, that doesn't fly anymore in the era of Trump. That's the, the fact that he goes out there and actually makes a living standing alone on a stage making people laugh is, I think, a good thing and a positive thing. And so 
the opportunity to have perhaps Dave as the standard bearer of the party, the Libertarian Party this time around, or have Dave in some role, I think is a loss. I, I think Dave is uh, someone who can really bring the rock party into the hoppy and the Rockwell message to people. And uh, I think I think something was lost this time around uh, because of, of Dave's position in the party. The one question is whether uh, it would actually be beneficial for Dave to have the party's endorsement to be its, its presidential nominee. Would that make him a more successful or less successful salesman of his message? Um, it seems to me there's a lot of drag that comes with being a nominee of a party, of any party, but particularly the Libertarians right now. Um, I, I just don't know that there's much upside to it. There may even be significant downsides. I, for one thing, think that running a, running a campaign that's worthy of you know, the office, I guess, would be um, an enormous expenditure of time and resources that, you know, a young father probably shouldn't be expending. Um, it is worth noting that Chase Oliver did go to all 50 states. And my, I understand no LP presidential candidate has ever done that before. Um, I, think, uh, I think there have been candidates that have kind of tried to run like from their office or something, um, you know, or, or their living room or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think now the, the problem is also that the word libertarian is associated with the Libertarian Party. So now, now that the Libertarian Party has this atrocious nominee, it degrades the word libertarian because now you see all these conservatives saying, well, I was, I, I was suspicious of libertarians before, but now my suspicions are confirmed. And like, you know, who wants to run around all the time cleaning up after these people saying, uh, look, these are the crazies. We have plenty of normal people in our ranks. It gets tiring, you know, like they're, they're the bull in a China shop for us. And we have to go around cleaning it up and, and saying, you know, some of us, uh, are, are respectable people. Well, it's, it's absolutely true. And uh, the, the LP, I think, has, has just found itself it, without a real definition of liberty. I mean, we can say the same thing about the terms liberal and conservative now. They become Orwell's meaningless, word, meaningless words. And what's liberty? It's not the Rothbardian absence of state coercion that we might define it as. I don't think that's the public's perception of the word at all. So I'm not sure that that word is still helpful to us. Well, as we kind of bring this to a close, um, I mean, I didn't get to see, I wish I'd gotten to see so much uh, else of it because I like to see Clint Russell uh, with Vivek. I guess Clint did really well. I don't understand, I mean, what else Clint could have done um, uh, there to, to, you know, to, to have success as the VP candidate. Um, but how do we want to wrap up here? I mean, I, cause I'm wondering, are we thinking more about what's, what's going to happen next with Trump? What's going to happen next with the libertarian party? Um, what do you do when you are running a political party whose nominee, uh, hates your guts, uh, which is true of Chase and a bunch of the people running the party now. I don't, I don't even know what the, what the closing question for this conversation is. Well, on that problem of having a nominee who is, you know, at odds with the party, I think you have to let professionalism be your rule there. So uh, the RNC had a lot of people who really hated Donald Trump, but to their credit, and this, these are people I don't like to give credit to, but in 2016, a number of those folks said, okay, Trump is our nominee. We have to get behind him and support him. So, you know, right now, the LP, as, as a party, if that's what it wants to be, if it wants to be, you know, something else, then it can have a different ethos. But if it wants to be a political party, it actually does have to get behind its nominee and show a degree of discipline. And, and, I, and I as think you they said, will. I mean, well, I as think, you said, uh, Chase Oliver, you know, may have, I mean, he has all these problems, but the fact that he went to 50 states, he actually put in the legwork, um, you know, professionalism counts. And the other thing, too, is that when I see... So I, you know, I, I know something about him. I know he's, a, you know, has all sorts of terrible views. But when you see photographs of him, sometimes he looks goofy because he's doing all the left-wing identity politics stuff. But there are a lot of photographs of the guy where he's just wearing a suit. He looks normal. You, you wouldn't think that this was anyone who had, you know, uh, a bizarre set of beliefs. Um, yeah, professionalism counts for a lot. So, I mean, this is an opportunity for the LP, I think, to kind of see, you know, what can you do in a situation like this where you're ideologically disappointed but can you at least on the technical side do enough that uh, you know, you're able to function as a party regardless of whether you're advancing philosophy? And by the way, this of course is very important for the LP because it has to maintain ballot access. If it starts to fall below 
a certain level of uh, voter support, they're going to lose ballot access in a number of states. And that's going to be disastrous, not just for this campaign, it's going to be disastrous for future libertarian nominees. So I would, I would you know, think there's a serious um, incentive here to you know, try to make the most of the bad hand you've been dealt. Uh, Jeff, you're somebody who's been, um, let's say somewhat aloof from politics, if I might put it that way, uh, not just LP, but politics in general, even though you worked for Ron Paul, uh, you haven't been the sort to say, um, I got to call my congressman or go knocking on doors for a political candidate or something like that. But so I'm, but I'm wondering in, in this day and age now where the, let's say the other side has grown um, I would say has more, um, I don't know, I, more determination, let's say, more brute determination to achieve its ends. Has the, 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 the vigor and determination of the other side done anything to dislodge those ideas from your head and make you think instead, well, the thing is, it's, it's easy for me to give speeches about the need to avoid politics, but if I avoid politics and other people like me avoid it, then that just leaves a void for crazy people to enter. And then I know what they're going to do with the power. Do you ever think that way? If not, why not? Yeah, it's true. Do you ever see the great movie Election with Matthew Broderick and Tracy Flick, the actress Reese Witherspoon? You know, that's, I think that's a nice allegory for American politics. It's about people who show up. Remember those people who were in student government when you were in eighth grade, right? Well, they're now your city council person or whatever it might be. I get it. I mean, I, this this used to be my, I guess, inner dialogue was, well, when we need a less political America. Everything's too politicized. And so markets are win-win and markets include civil society and politics is zero sum. And so we had to shrink politics down to its tiniest size. Um, and, and then I think that's been challenged. It's been challenged by the relentless, relentlessness of the progressive left. They, they won the 20th century, and yet they still get the media to portray them as underdogs against some mysterious power structure that doesn't exist because they're in charge of it. Um, and so one of the great, greatest tricks, one of the greatest achievements of progressives, and all, all, I would say there's right-wing progressives, people who think man needs to be perfected to serve the state, right? John McCain is a progressive. Maybe Marco Rubio is a progressive. But nonetheless, one of the greatest achievements of progressives was to politicize every facet of American life and then just say, well, believing what I believe, that's not political. I just want a clean environment. I just think, you know, women should be human beings and be allowed to work. In other words, they politicize everything and then, then just say, well, wanting a clean water, that's not political. Uh, and so it's left people like me, I think, out in the cold, largely. There's not a... a the GOP remains pretty rank, at least at its professional levels. And the LP, we've discussed ad nauseum today, and the, the Democrats, uh, you know, they're not the party of Jim Webb anymore. They're not the party of um, even JFK. So it's, it's easy to feel homeless, and it's easy to feel powerless. Uh, it's, it's easy to say, well, just focus on your own let's say life, family, mortgage, career, whatever it might be. Uh, but, and, and there's also this siren song of localism. Well, go out there and get involved in your own city council or your own school board or whatever. And I, I su suspect that's probably a good idea. And I suspect that democracy only works really locally. I think Switzerland is a, is a nice example. Uh, but I don't think Switzerland is possible in a country of 330 million people this divided. So uh, I'm not sure we get there um, without, or, or even get closer without first and foremost, just defeating the left-wing juggernaut. I think that's just the bottom line. That might require people on the sidelines like me to just get off our dust. Dan, I see you nodding. So as we, uh, as we finish up, do, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, libertarians are naturally quite idealistic and that's one of the, you know, good qualities that they have in many respects so that they, you know, believe, uh, positive things about humanity. They think that the world can be a better place than it is today. Uh, there's an admirable side to that, but there's also a side which makes them uh, in themselves perfectionists. And I think Jeff was quite right that uh, just as progressives have used perfectionism as something to drive their own power, libertarians, on the other hand, let their form of protectionism cripple them politically and prevent them from acting. 
And Jeff is quite right. What you need to do is engage defensively. So even if libertarians can't get a perfect candidate, even if they can't, you know, I mean, the idea that you could get a libertarian state, a state that's no longer a state, a state that's no longer dangerous, that's obviously not going to work. But if you can get a state that is less dangerous, a state that is going to get you into fewer wars, a state that's going to stay out of World War III, a state that's not going to, uh, you know, throw you in jail as quickly as another kind of regime that might be in power, those kinds of incremental differences really matter a lot, especially in day-to-day -day lives. So there is a very strong case, I think, for libertarians to take the offer that Donald Trump has extended to them and to get involved, supporting him, but also basically to say, hey, you said we, you want us to be part of your coalition. We will agree to be part of that coalition, but we want to make sure that we're getting something in return. And Jeff is quite right. Trump is very transactional here. If libertarians are able to say, okay, here's something reasonable. Here's one or two or three issues that we want to focus on. Can you deliver on this? And then give us a seat at the table so that as other things come up, we can talk about foreign policy. We can talk about why we have a view that is radically different from the neocons who want to urge you into wars. Being a seat, having a seat at that table is actually very valuable. So, you know, I'm in favor of engagement, but I think for libertarians, it has to be a defensive engagement. And that's completely all right. That cuts against this idea that we could actually have, you know, that libertarians could have a nominee or a, a president or a government that somehow is fully libertarian, because that is, that's, you know, kind of a, uh, that's in, in, seeking, in, 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 in reaching for that perfection, you're actually short circuiting and depriving yourself of the good you can achieve in the here and now. All right, and with that, we will uh, call it quits. I'm 10 minutes overdue to start dinner anyway. It's my turn tonight. So um, Jeff Deist, monetary-metals.com slash woods, by the way. Uh, check out uh, uh, Jeff's important work over there. And then, of course, Dan over at modernagejournal.com. And Dan, I enjoy reading your columns uh, in the New York Post. Um, they make me happy. I'm glad, well, you're, I'm glad you're doing them. And, and, and they're so fresh and original every week. I mean, Dan has made modern age relevant again. It's oh, and, and the work on modern age is even even better. Yeah, because for a long time, we knew modern age was there, but that was about it. But Dan has reinvigorated it. Uh, he's he's you know put some extra gusto and life into the old thing, and and that that's a that's a tremendous advance. So so congratulations, Dan. Thank you both. I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.